So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lee Brandstetter. I direct the Future of Work initiative here at the Block Center. And with our colleagues across the Block Center, we're dedicated to leveraging Carnegie Mellon's deep understanding of emerging technology and its quantitative social science acumen to help ensure that those currently being left behind can participate more fully in the prosperity that technological innovation brings. Now, if we're going to really succeed in achieving this incredibly ambitious goal, we're going to have to do something very hard. We're going to have to make American education great again. Now, as hard as it may be to believe today, for more than 100 years, the United States actually led the world in educating its citizens. Now, it must be said that all the opportunities were not available to all in these earlier decades and centuries. That certainly wasn't the case in the southern states like Kentucky, where I come from. But relative to the other advanced nations of the time, the United States did more and it acted sooner to truly establish mass primary education and then to truly establish mass secondary education. And through our land-grant colleges and public policies like the GI Bill, we expanded access to higher education. This was a singular American achievement, and it was an important force propelling America's rise as the preeminent industrial power in the world. Now, this graph comes from a great book called The Race Between Education and Technology, written by Harvard University's Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. And what we see in this graph taken from the book is that from the 1880s to the 1960s, every cohort of American workers had more formal education than the cohort that preceded it in the labor market. America's industrializing economy was demanding ever more skill. But America's education system was increasing the supply of skill even faster than the market was demanding it. So much so that between the 1930s and the 1960s, income inequality actually shrank, even as the economy entered a post-war boom. During that period, America was winning the race between education and technology. But unfortunately, in more recent years, that long-standing rapid growth in education and skill has slowed substantially. And the problem is that demand for higher levels of skill has continued to grow perhaps faster than ever as our economy becomes ever more skill, uh, skill and technology intensive. What that means is that we've got a growing imbalance between skill supply and skill demand, and that is generating an explosion of income inequality. Now, this graph is taken from the work of MIT economist David Otter. It breaks down wage trends by education level for American male workers. The picture for female workers would show uh, a very similar set of trends. And what we see depicted in this graph, graph is a widening chasm between the wage trends of our most educated fellow citizens, depicted by that top blue graph, and the wage trends of our least educated fellow citizens, depicted by the bottom red graph. For highly educated Americans, the American dream is working as well as it ever has. For the less educated, incomes adjusted for inflation are falling. As our economy becomes more technology intensive, their labor is just not demanded as strongly. And as always, these broad-based adverse trends tend to hit our historically disadvantaged groups with disproportionate intensity. You know, all the skills that we might talk about, mathematics may be the most salient. It's the gateway to the remunerative careers of the 21st century. You can't get into or through a CS degree or a data science degree without a high level of skill in math. And all Americans, or at least most Americans, are weaker in this critical domain than they should be. But our historically disadvantaged groups are especially poorly prepared for a math-driven future. Mathematics is the domain where test score-based differences across ethnic groups are the largest, and they're disturbingly persistent. That's what we can see in this graph, where over a generation, policy after policy and curriculum after curriculum have been tried in an effort to narrow that skill gap, and nothing seems to have worked. And here's the even worse news, right? This measures the skill, skill gap at age 13. These gaps grow in the high school years. By grade 12, 
the test score differences can be as large as a standard deviation. For statisticians, this is a canyon-sized and morally unacceptable gap. And the gaps related to parental income and education are also large and growing over time. But fortunately, learning science offers us some hope. There is a long-standing stream of research in learning sciences that goes all the way back to the 1980s that suggests that radical changes in our educational practices could yield huge increases in learning outcomes. Back in the early 80s, learning science pioneer Benjamin Bloom and his students conducted a series of fascinating experiments where they randomly divided students into a control group that learned material in a conventional classroom and a treatment group where students learned the same material but each student had a personal tutor. When they compared the learning outcomes across these two groups, they were astounded by the results. Because the average student in the tutored group performed on these tests of comprehension a full two standard deviations higher than the average student in the classroom control group. What that means is that the average tutored student did better than 98% of the students in the control classroom group. Now, I'm just going to repeat that again for en emphasis. Right? The average student in the tutor group did better than 98% of the students in the control classroom group. Now, what this suggests is that if we could personalize instruction, we could achieve much better learning outcomes, even for those who are currently far behind. But in the early 1980s, Benjamin Bloom couldn't see any technologically feasible learning technology that could allow for personalized instruction at a politically acceptable cost. And the question is, are we in a different place today? Now at this point, I want to turn to the research of my collaborator and colleague, John Gurian, who's an economist at Northwestern University in Chicago. John and his research team have put Ben Bloom's ideas to a very interesting large-scale test. They recruited thousands of underperforming male students from some of Chicago's most challenged public schools into a study in which students were randomly assigned to a control group, which got standard math support, and a treatment group where each student met with a personal tutor, one tutor to two students, for an hour a day every day of the academic year. And the results were amazing. The learning gains for the students in the treatment group were so great that they effectively narrowed the racial achievement gap in mathematics by one third in a single year. But the cost of this intervention were high because of its human resource intensity. John Gurian and his research team figure that this intervention cost about $4,000 per student per year. And of course, what that means is that the public school districts that need this intervention the most can't afford it. Now here's the question. Could we use AI in combination with human tutors to close these achievement gaps, realizing the same kinds of gains as in John Gurian's study, but at a much lower cost? Now this brings me to the work of my colleague and collaborator here at CMU, Ken Kadinger. For three decades, Ken has led a research team that has been working to create AI-driven adaptive learning systems to accelerate human learning, especially in mathematics. The way these systems work is that they give students problems, figure out on the basis of the mistakes student ma students make what they don't know, and then give the students focused instruction in that material until they achieve mastery. And because this is software driven, the marginal cost of giving an additional student access to this system is very, very low. Now, in some studies, these kinds of AI driven adaptive learning systems have been demonstrated to uh, generate enormous learning gains, right? In one well done study done by the Pittsburgh office of the Rand Corporation, it was shown that these systems double the rate of math learning relative to a control group and at a very low cost per student. Now, you can't take humans out of the loop because a machine is never going to be able to replicate a human being's ability to empathize, to show respect, to give encouragement, and to hold students accountable for the work that they should be doing. So could we combine humans and AI to eliminate these achievement gaps? Now, the honest answer is that we don't know, but we have a moral obligation to find out. 
So here's our game plan. This spring, right here in Pittsburgh, we're going to be putting combinations of human tutors and AI in front of underperforming students in Pittsburgh public schools. And in the coming months, we're going to be doing a similar set of studies in Chicago. Now, these AI-driven adaptive learning systems record student engagement with the system second by second, generating an incredibly rich statistical portrait of the student's learning progress and the student's learning challenges. Now, we can integrate and combine these streams of data into a digital dashboard that would enable human tutors to understand where each student is and what each student needs at every point in time. We can vary tutor practice and machine functionality and leverage the incredibly rich data record being generated by the system to observe the impact on student le learning in something close to real time. Now, all this could enable us to engineer the best, most synergistic combination of human empathy and respect and encouragement and AI power, and our best ideas could be implemented at scale. New technology, driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning, may be placing in our hands the capability to realize Benjamin Bloom's seemingly impossible dream of personalized instruction for every student at a politically acceptable cost. Now, much work needs to be done before this dream can be fully realized. Thanks to Keith Block's vision and generosity, we're off to a great start. We've already been able to build on that by receiving a $1.5 million grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to support this research. We've got additional support from Pittsburgh's Hillman Foundation. We're reaching out to the Heinz Endowments, but of course, the resources that we have now and the for resources that we might get later this year are only a fraction of the resources that we'll eventually need. I expect to be working on this for the next 10 years, possibly for the remainder of our, my scientific career. You know, but if we can use the same technology that has exacerbated income inequality to narrow it, if we can eliminate racial achievement gaps in STEM subjects in this generation, if we could radically accelerate learning in the K through 12 grades, then this will be the most morally significant thing that I ever do in my scientific career. These are our children. This is their future. They deserve nothing less than our very best efforts. Thank you very much.